I think for myself, um, I managed to climb the ladder quite quickly and I was working with people who were a lot more senior than myself, but I didn't feel like they wanted me there or they felt that I was equal to them. And also being a, a male of colour and being the only male of colour within that team, I think there was a culture of going out, drinking after work, not being from that background or not being a part of that culture was very different for me. So I wasn't involved in maybe some of the team banter, as you could call it, um, not fitting into some of the jokes or, you know, just generally being accepted as part of the team. One of the kind of most significant memories for me that's kind of enforced in my head that actually I need to, to do my own thing was I worked for a recruitment organisation and I was the only, in a building of about 300, I was the only black woman that wasn't a cleaner. And I remember, I, I, obviously you can see I've got quite big hair. I used to wear my hair as I'm, I'm wearing it now and in lots of different natural styles and uh, my contract wasn't renewed. And I remember people in my team being in uproar, like this doesn't make any sense. And I remember the last day I had my hair straightened, just purely coincidentally. And the lady that had chosen not to extend my contract, she saw me in the corridor and she said, oh, your hair looks really nice. It's a shame you didn't do it like that before. Maybe it would have worked out differently for you here. And I remember at that time saying, I don't ever want to be in a position where somebody can say something like that to me and actually have the power to prevent me pursuing what I want to do. I got a job in a large teaching hospital in London and I um, went to one of my first meetings and it was an important meeting about a regulatory issue. And as I turned around and looked around, there was 50 people in the room and I was the only person of colour. And then I actually felt it and I was like, this is the first time in my whole, and that I'd been qualified around 15 years by that point. So the first time that I noticed it. And because I noticed it there, then I started to take more of an interest in what's going on around me, what's going on in, in the actual data. When I was growing up, us in our little community, we had to protect each other. Um, and when I mean our community, I mean the Afro-Caribbean community specifically, but in ethnic minority communities, we had to protect each other because we had to use our own institutions to do that. Why I'm a director of a credit union bank is because banks will lend to black people. I decided to go to an ethnicity group uh, event organized by Lloyds because I wanted to see what would it offer different. And that's when it really opened my eyes to listen to some of the experiences that people had. And I felt that there was a lot more that could be done to help colleagues. And that, you know, um, there was a reason that these initiatives existed. A judge in the US city of Minneapolis has sentenced the former police officer George Derek Floyd, Chauvin to 22 and a half years and in jail the for the Black Lives Matter movement. It's captured, I think, the emotions and feelings of a group of people, my people, that have been ignored for a very long time and the frustrations have really, really built up. I think it was a moment where the rest of the world began to really see what we had been dealing with for years at this point. And it's extremely sad that it took the death of somebody in such a horrific way for this to happen. When you looked at the Black Lives Matter match, it wasn't black people matching. It wasn't black and white people matching. It was all the community, all the young people were matching. Over the last 14 years, what I've seen is that the awareness, the need to talk and communicate has definitely increased. And what Black Lives Matter has done is given that focus of why it's important and why it's important for everybody to be educated. There was a whole scenario in the media recently about saying we all have the same 24 hours. Now, yes, we do all have the same 24 hours, but do we all have the same challenges? Certain individuals from certain backgrounds will have an advantage. It's often talked about that women have a disadvantage, people of colour have a disadvantage, and it's about making that a level playing field and making sure everyone's starting the race at the same point. In the 80s, you didn't have this concept of diversity and inclusion in the way that we understand it now. So back then, uh, if you walked into a building and there was loads of diverse people there, you ticked your box. Now there's a recognition that diversity without inclusion 
it's just an illusion. So you're not really embracing the fact that this has a business benefit as well as the right thing to do. When I was at school, which was in 90s and the noughties, I remember very distinctly being told you will not succeed because you are black. And literally that sentence was, was told to me. I was also um, told when I spoke to the careers advisor that I wanted to become whatever it is, probably a TV presenter, an international singer, whatever it was at the time. I was told, don't you think that you're setting your sights a bit too high? People from your background don't really achieve those kind of level of things. Have you ever considered being a cleaner? These are facts, this is, I'm, I'm not embellishing anything. This is word for word what I was told. You, you hear this thing and I hear lots of black people saying that they were told you have to work twice as hard to, to get half the distance or something like that. And my parents didn't really say that to me. My parents said, you're black and you're going to face discrimination, but you're going to be excellent anyway. I met a lady once who said to me she only became an accountant because she went to a careers fair where she met a black man and she didn't know a black man could be an accountant. That is how much representation means to young people in this country is that if they can't see themselves in positions how can they ever aspire to be like that this is a new era we're not going to go backwards so if you don't address those sort of routines and procedures in your company then you're gonna fail i think to shred all of that you need education you need to understand the contribution the positive contribution from all aspects of your community in the UK and to UK history and celebrate it every day of the year. Many people can probably relate to this, but schools can be part of the problem growing up. They can create that imposter syndrome, especially if you're a minority in a majority white school. You can feel like you're, you don't belong there or you, know, you could be treated slightly different. Imposter syndrome disproportionately impacts women and ethnic minorities. Now, why is that? It's because from a very young age, we're told what we cannot do. We're told what we cannot be. We are told what we cannot achieve. So therefore, when we start to achieve as women, as people of color, and we start to be celebrated and we start to, to achieve successes, we struggle to accept it because it's been indoctrinated in us from within the schooling system, but also I think the media has a key part to play in this, that you can't amount to anything, you're not good enough and you cannot. So even when we are exhibiting the total opposite, inside we still feel, actually maybe I'm not doing enough, maybe, maybe it's not me. And I think in this country there's not enough acknowledgement or recognition of how impactful your early years in this world can have on your progression in life. Uh, my wife and myself this time went down to my son's parents evening when he was in secondary school and his history teacher actually said to him in front of us, uh, oh Shaquille, you're gonna really love it next semester. We're gonna be showing roots. Have you ever seen roots before? Oh, which me and my wife kind of covered our mouth and because and, Shaquille was mortified. So the fact that we have in our library at home, Seize the Time uh, by Bobby Seale, all the Maya Angelou books, James Baldwin. I mean, he's well read for a teacher to say, the only thing that we need to understand is about slavery and the story of slavery. It's incredulous. I do think that uh, some of those aspects need to be taught in schools. So we're not seen like we are immigrants in our own country. I don't believe in tokenism. I don't believe that you should put somebody in a role just because of their, their skin, their race, their gender, their sexuality, not for those reasons. But I do believe that if you create an environment where people can, like I said before, reach their full potential, then you're going to very naturally see a diversity that will take place because talent, skill, ability is distributed evenly. It's not with any one group of people. If your system is working correctly, then these things will happen naturally. And if it's not happening, then that means there's a bigger problem that you do need to address. So really thinking about where are the potential biases, especially the unconscious ones in your company, or where are the barriers that are being put up? And if you're seeing trends happening, so for example, if you're seeing you're losing a lot of talent of a certain demographic, then speak to people, find out why are they leaving? Why aren't they happy? Why aren't they succeeding? And what you're gonna find is that the problem is unlikely to be with them, and it's more likely to, to be with how you've created your company having the right culture within your organisation rather than setting targets. And I know I might be the minority in, in saying that, but actually 
we've got the data there. It's what, what is the data telling you and what is it you want to achieve? What's the objective of this? The objective is inclusion. And if you're starting to make groups of sort of disenfranchised um, individuals, then you're never going to have that inclusion. What you want is to work on from, you know, the culture, from junior levels, from school, what's going on, you know, how you include. I think that's more important than targets. And I'm from a, from a minority background, and I don't want people to think that I got a job because I'm an Asian woman. I, I got the job because I was the best person for the job. I think the role of the manager here is so critical. And that is why education has to be at all levels, because you can educate senior leaders, you can educate directors. It's the manager who's coaching, you know, an operation analyst or a project assistant, and how they can help them progress their journey and give them that belief. So mentoring is really important to help those who are disadvantage to catch up and have the same advantages that everyone else would have. If you don't have strong management or strong leadership, then your company's going to fall apart. Um, I'm a big believer that you ultimately can only go as far as your leaders within any organization. So if you have managers that aren't able to create a safe environment and aren't able to navigate those difficult conversations, then you're essentially cutting your foot off. You're going to fail sooner or later. This might be a slow death. So really investing into the development of your managers or your personal leadership skills will be an investment that will always pay off. One of the things that I really like about CMI's motto is, you know, where it talks about the transforming accidental managers into conscious leaders. It's the conscious leaders. We have a lot of people in organizations who are accidental managers. You know, someone's worked their way up or someone's come out of uni, they've been on a good grad program. They don't necessarily have that management training or that leadership around them to help them understand some of the challenges. Who I recruit, um, who I bring into my team, how we work effectively together as a team is all driven by by some sort of um, unconscious bias, either mine or the other people within the team. So knowing what it is and making sure that you bring that to the forefront means that you have a better working workforce and better working life, really. In meritocracy, where all you're doing is employing the same people that look like you, behave like you, come from the same background as you, then you're going to never get to that point where you're, you're squeezing out the, the correct amount of expertise and authenticity that allows to be innovative. So again, we're back to the society's view on what's good and what's not good needs to shift and change so that the whole of society can benefit from it. It's that un fighting that unconscious bias education programs, awareness, and colleagues coming forward to talk and share their stories. That's really, really important because time and time again, we hear the absence of role models is one of the key things that impacts, you know, more junior colleagues or employees because they don't see it. They think, how am I gonna move forward? What is important is there needs to be equity. So. I may be not used to being in these environments because I'm not from these communities or I've been locked out, I've been excluded from these opportunities. So I now need an extra level of support. Recruitment is definitely one area that needs to be industry-wide, needs to be looked at because blind recruitment in itself doesn't solve it. The challenge we saw, we run a, run a very small pilot uh, in a much smaller department. What we saw was that ethnic minority colleagues weren't actually putting the application in. If you don't have them in the recruitment pool, you can't recruit them. So it's getting them to the point where they feel confident and empowered and genuinely believe in themselves that they will have a fair chance. Some of the key questions you need to be asking is what are your policies around diversity and inclusion? What are your policies around um, racism, sexism, like what, what are the procedures that are followed if somebody reports those things? What um, kind of support do you provide for women, for people of colour in your organisation to help them feel included? Do you have any uh, networks for specific minority communities? We need to be in a cult culture where we can call things out and we, we're not ashamed 
to stand up for ourselves. That has always been the case with a lot of people where they've been discriminated for years and years and years. And for them, they feel it's normal. And I think we need to get people, especially young people, to understand that you know certain behaviors are not normal and are not acceptable the importance is equity we've got to we've got to look at this argument as not just having diversity so again it's not just about the data it's not just about having loads of people in your organization of color that doesn't fix the argument if they're not being treated the same as everyone else or you're not leveling up the platform for them to be able to achieve what everyone else can achieve it's about holding each other accountable and hearing those stories throughout your career, that means that you can make changes. It's not just about um, management or leadership holding me to account, it's about me holding leadership to account. What organisations need to be doing is looking at how they upskill existing members of staff using the levy, using the apprenticeship opportunities, whether it is sort of qualification CMI offer. My main driver, and I think I said this on my interview, was it's about what we do with the data and how we deliver. It's about making the right decisions for, for members, but also the right decision for um, leaders and managers and people across, across you know, all walks of life. So I think it's about the, the leadership having a, a change in mindset. And also, as capitalistic as it sounds, getting them to understand the financial benefits. Let's talk to them about the things that are important to them right if you've got people from lots of different kind of backgrounds whether that be gender race um, even ableism then you're going to get diversity of thought which then means your organization is going to be uh, much more innovative and if you've got a more innovative organization it's much more likely that it's going to be more competitive which leads to more money what i would really like to ask the government to do is to really be firm on setting stuff like the um ethnicity pay gap reporting and, and kind of putting in sanctions for organisations that don't adhere to that, but also looking at more of the qualitative stuff um, and, and looking at what are the experiences of individuals in organisations and actually if they're not in line with what's being reported, then what needs to be done? I think there's plenty of policy out there. There's a, you know, we've got the Race Discrimination Act. There's, there's plenty of legislation in place. The change that needs to take place is cultural change and people's mentalities. We need to see this as an issue and it needs to be addressed as a serious issue. We have role model lists where basically anybody can be nominated. Then those colleagues who are in the role models list, they're asked to come and talk, share their experience with the wider colleagues. Most recently, um, we've introduced a race education program. So, you know, talking about how does it get cascaded? It's at multiple levels and through multiple lenses. So there's networks, there's divisional networks. So it's making sure that that communication doesn't stop. A target in itself is meaningless unless it has purpose. So it's got to be purposeful, targeted outcomes. And then you, the data needs to, to track that progress. We have an opportunity as a society to create real systematic change and ultimately create a, a world where everybody is seen and heard and treated equally. Maybe that's me being optimistic in terms of what I, what I want to see and what I believe can happen. Diversity is one of our biggest strengths. Um, if anything, living in London, then it's something that we see every single day, seeing different types of people, different cultures, different ideas mixing, and it's through that strength of that diversity that amazing things happen. When you change the culture or the systems in the organization to help, help everybody reach their full potential, then the group that you made those changes for, it goes beyond just them. Everybody benefits.